I want to talk to you tonight about there being only one camp meeting tent. And look around the, the people in this tent tonight. I mean, we are from everywhere on the face of the earth. This is a wonderful kind of view like what heaven's going to be like. People from every tribe and nation and language and kindred and tongue and people. And look around you. This is the kind of a world that we live in. There are a few people in some places in the world that don't uh, have the kind of variety that we have here. And it's just wonderful. Uh, we also have different kind of varieties because some of us learn on the right-hand side of our brain and some of us learn on the left-hand side of the brain. Some of us are very creative and some of us are more organized and structured. And then there are the different ways that we learn. Like, you know, there's one theory that says there are, there are uh, learners who are primarily visual learners and there are learners who are primarily auditory learners and then there are these kinesthetic learners. And what they say is that the people that are sitting in the back of the tent are usually auditory learners. All they care about is being able to hear, if the mic is working anyway. All you want to do is be able to hear. You don't care the fact that there are all these kind of people in front of you. That's all right with you. You just kind of sit back here and listen for the words. You don't need to see the screen. You don't mind by all the people sitting. You just want to hear the words. And some auditory learners like to sit back and close their eyes and just hear the words. And they usually sit in the back. So I'm going to watch the next couple nights. If any of you close your eyes and you're sitting back, I figure you're just auditory learners, okay? I don't think anybody go to sleep, but we'll just sit. Yeah. And then the people in the middle, they say are kinesthetic learners. You like people sitting around you, and you, you, you like to hug people, and, and you, you like a, a lot of crowds, and you just want to be in the middle of them. We're going to get this worked out before Sabbath at the, the end of the week. And then the people in the front are often people who are visual learners. They don't want anything between them and what's going on up front. They want to see the singers. They want to be able to read the PowerPoint. They just want to be able to... So we're different learners. And some of us have gone on beyond those three designations to... Howard Gardner's 1984 theory that there are multiple intelligences that we have. You know, even in a family, there are just uh, a few different characteristics. It depends on the, on the birth order and all kinds of environmental things. How many of you have uh, brothers and sisters? Let me see your hand. See, even in a family like this, there are all kinds of things. I have three kids. I wasn't able to shout out too much about this. I have a lovely daughter who lives on the east coast of the state. She's a pastor in a big church there and just uh, so proud of her. She's a great gal. I get to talk to her every week when she writes sermons and we talk about uh, what the best way is to talk about the love of Jesus. I have a son who lives at uh, Riverside where I live. He's uh, got a master's in physical therapy. He's married to a lovely girl. They've got two beautiful little girls and uh, it's so much fun to be close to them and I've got a son who's 23 years old and he's a senior in college and and my three kids are totally different they've started out totally different they weren't just uh, different in characteristics but even the way they came into the world was different with our daughter I did the nervous father in the waiting room routine you know uh, my wife was doing all the work in the delivery room and I paced the room like dads are supposed to do, and I looked at my watch and wondered how long it was going to take. And then my daughter was born, and they brought the daughter out and showed it to me. And oh, it was such a lovely thing. And then when our son was born, I got to go into the delivery room. And I thought that was really special. A lot of people do that today, but when my first son was born, we didn't do that too much. So I thought it was a pretty good thing. And I went in there, and I, I was uh, not too nervous. I tried to help my wife along as well as she can in those circumstances. And all of a sudden, we had a son, and we were delighted. About two weeks before our third child was born, uh, my wife said, uh, you know, if, we, if this happens like the first two happened, we've got two weeks. They're going to come on their due date. Everything's going to be just fine. And I said, that's going to go great. And I went to school to teach. And about two hours later, my wife called me on the phone, and she said, Stuart, you need to get home. The baby's going to be born today. 
And I said, well, I'm in the middle of teaching. doesn't matter. The baby's not waiting for you. You come home. So I quickly got a substitute teacher. I ran home, came, got, drove up the driveway, and there was my wife and our two little kids standing on the front porch of our house. My wife had a suitcase. She was ready to go to the hospital right now. So we got in the car. She got in the front seat in the passenger side. Uh, where I drive, we drive on the wrong side of the road, you know. So she was sitting over here. I was driving our two little kids in the back seat of the car. And we began to drive. It took about 15 minutes to get down to the motorway. And then we were a half an hour from that point to the hospital where my wife had decided this would be nice. It's going to be our last child. We'll have this child in a natural childbirth kind of a way. There'd be a birthing room and a midwife and no operating room. This is going to be a natural delivery. Little did she know. We got onto the freeway and my wife said, you know what, you're going to have to go faster than this. This baby isn't waiting. And my wife would begin to to breathe, you know how women do when they have the baby. (sighs) Breathe faster. I can't breathe any faster. That's faster. (sighs) Breathe harder. That's as hard as I can breathe. My wife is the loveliest person in the world and we never have these kind of conversations. And all of a sudden she was snapping my head off every time I said anything to her. In the back seat, my two little kids were going, Dad, what's the matter with Mom? And, and Mom would start to, to moan and breathe. And my little daughter said, Dad, what's the matter with Mom? And I said, oh, nothing. <laughs> and my wife looked over at me. If she could have pushed me out of the car, I would have been out. Nothing? It was one of those looks like, this is your fault. I should never have talked to you in the first place. So here I'm saying, well, she's about to have the baby. It's coming a little bit early, but don't worry. We're on the way to the hospital. And my wife said, you better go faster. We're never going to make it. So I began to drive a little faster than I had usually driven down that road. I've got to tell you a little bit about this car that I was driving. It was a Honda Civic when Honda Civics were about this big. And, and I had bought it from the shop teacher at the academy where I taught who was a great guy for, guy for getting wrecked cars and, and refurbishing them and then selling them so that we could drive them. And he had found this little Honda Civic that had been in a, in a head-on collision, and he just cut off the front half of the Honda and threw it away and kept the back half. And a couple weeks later, he found a Honda that had been rear-ended, and he cut off the rear end and kept the front end, and he kind of married the two of the ends like that, there was a big seam of where the weld went over the, the top. And, and he said to me, this will be the best car that you've ever had. It'll last forever. And so I bought it from him. And that was the car. I was driving real fast down the highway with my wife saying, you better go a little faster. Well, I was pushing this little Honda to places where I never thought it would go. Um, I wish I was better on my conversion between miles per hour and kilometers. But we were getting about... 85 to 90 miles an hour down the freeway with my wife saying, go faster. The two kids in the back saying, why is mom breathing that way? And I'm trying to steer this car down the road when all of a sudden, all the lights on the dashboard came on. Just like that. And I pushed the accelerator and there was absolutely nothing behind it. Just like that. And I looked, the lights were all on And I realized that the car was off, the lights were on, and we were just coasting down the freeway. My wife looked over at me and said, why are you slowing down? Well, we're having a little bit of a problem with the car. So um, I started to try to figure out where, where I was going to get off, what I was going to do. So what did I do wrong? Is it the car? No. It's going to be hard if I have to yell at you all the time. Anyway, uh, we're going down the freeway, slowing down, and I'm looking ahead and thinking there is a place over there where I can pull off the side of the road. If I'm going fast enough, I'll coast up to the top, and I'll go down around the corner, and I'll find a phone, and I'll call some friends that live nearby, and they'll come, and they'll take us to the hospital, and everything will be fine. My wife kept panting and and, uh, moaning, and the kids kept saying, what's the matter? And finally... I pulled off to the side of the road. I was hoping in between that a policeman would come by. Isn't it true that policemen have 
practice or they're taught how to deliver babies in emergency situations. I was always thought that they did. Where are those guys when you need them? I couldn't find one anywhere. So I pulled off the side of the road and I couldn't even make it up the off ramp. I pulled to the side and my wife said, now what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm going to go run over there. I'm going to get a phone. I'm going to call some friends. She said, no, you're not. You're going to go out there and you're going to get a car. I looked out there. It was the highway. I looked at her. She said, go get a car. My wife never talks to me this way, but I knew she meant business. And so instead of running up the hill and going to get a car, I mean a phone, I went out into the middle of the freeway and I started going like this. And the first car that came to me had two young ladies in it and they looked at me like, like I was a serial rapist or something, you know. <laughs> and they, they, they went around me like this and just kept going down the freeway. And I said to my wife, oh, this is not going to work. And she just went. <laughs> so I kept going like this. And sure enough, the second car that came by stopped. And the woman said, what, what's the matter? I said, we're having a baby in the car. She's, and the car broke down. She said, well, get in here. So I went back and I got my wife. I put her in the back seat of this stranger's car. And my two little kids were missing. They weren't in the back seat of the car. I looked around. And over there, by a fence to the side of the road, there was my daughter and my son kneeling down, praying that something good would happen for their mother. I called them and they came. They got in the front seat of the car. This was a big car, not the little Honda Civic that we had. The woman was a teacher that goes from school to school to teach certain classes. And she had been to one school already. She was on her way to another school. And she had a box of books in the back, and she, she took it out and opened the back of the car and put it in and noticed that in the back of the car there were two big beach towels. The day before, she had been to the beach, and she looked at Karen and she said, eh, maybe I better get those towels and get them in the car. The back seat of the car had plastic seat covers on it. It was the perfect car for us. My wife got in the back seat of the car. The kids got in the front. I crawled in the back seat with, uh, with my wife. And the woman said to me, where are we going? And I said, well, our hospital. And I named it. And it was still 20 minutes on the other side of the city. And she said, we'll never make it. There's a hospital three minutes away from here. That's where we're going to go. My wife sat up and said, but we've already paid the bill over there. I said, sit down. We're going to go to this one. Here. Fine. <laughs> we didn't get up to the light when my wife said, it's going to happen right now. My kids were in the front seat, and they kept looking over the seat like this at their mother, and then they would back down like this, and they'd look. And uh, we got ready. The woman went up, turned left, went over the freeway, turned right toward the hospital. My wife pushed once. There was the head of this baby. I'm straddling my wife on the back seat. I had a lot of uh, practice with this. Uh, in my high school baseball team, I was the catcher. You know, I was the guy like that. And uh, my, my, <laughs> my wife pushed twice, and there was the baby. And I, I held him. I caught him. He, he was a little boy. And I, I held him up and said to the kids, look. They looked, and they went, ew, what is that, you know? Um... I looked down at him and I realized that he wasn't breathing. And, and I, I began to think, we went through all of this and we're going to lose him. And my wife, who's a nurse, who delivered a baby before, said, um, is, is he breathing? And I said, no, he's not. She said, well, you better spank him. You know, that's a terrible thing to do to a child when he comes about. I put him up on my, on my shoulder and... Uh, I, I reached down to that little bare bottom and I went, nothing happened. And my wife said, no, you're going to have to spank him. Oh, I didn't want to do that, but he wasn't breathing and I knew she knew what she was talking about. So I went, nothing happened. And now I knew that somehow we're going to lose this guy. And I was feeling sick. And my wife sat up on her elbows and she reached over and she said, no, you got to go like this. And, and our little baby went, oh. Like that. Oh, boy, it was a wonderful moment. And you know, the baby just turns all pink, and he was so cute, and 
began to cry. And you'd cry too if my wife hit you like that. And, uh, it was a wonderful moment. My, uh, the, the driver said, well, we might as well go to your hospital now. He's already born and you paid the bill there. So she turned right and 15 minutes later, we drove into the emergency room of this hospital where we are expecting a natural childbirth, you know. This whole time now, for about 20 minutes, I'm straddling my wife in the back seat of the car, holding the baby, turning and showing everybody that's passing by, you know, it's going on like that. And uh, I didn't realize what happens to you when you when you kind of do this with your legs for, I was kind of sitting on my back leg for 20 minutes. We got to the hospital, to the emergency room, and um, now I got to tell you the other part of this, and you're all adults, so you know, but you know what comes along with, with childbirth, and, and this is all coming at me, and, and my left leg was covered with blood and fluid and everything, and I got out of the car, and I couldn't walk. I've been like this for 20 minutes, I was going, oh, my word, like that, and I... I walked into the emergency room of the hospital, and there was a line of people in the emergency room, you know. And so I got in line, and people began to turn around and look at me like, whoa, what happened to you? And I said, we just had a baby. And they went, what? (laughs) No, no, my wife had a baby out in the car. And uh, they all parted like the Red Sea parted for the Israelites. I went right up to the counter. And they said, I said, see the car out there? We just had a baby in the car. Well, tell the car to drive around the corner. So I hobbled out. I said to the driver, just drive around the corner like that. I reached in and I grabbed my camera. And I began taking pictures of all the people that came out to see what had happened. There were doctors and nurses and secretaries from uh, the emergency place there, uh, Two or three accountants came out to make sure we had paid the bill. I don't think that's true. That's not true. Um, uh, Two doctors climbed in the back seat with uh, Karen and the baby and cut the cord, wrapped the baby up, handed him to a nurse. I took a picture just as he went by. Nurse walked in. Uh, uh, they, They said, Karen, you're fine. Can you walk? She said, I think so. It happened so fast. She walked out of the car put her on a gurney and wheeled her into the hospital. I walked in, uh, my two little kids following their mother and the baby in there, and I walked in just to see where they were going to go. And then I went back, and I opened the door to the car, and there was this woman that I hadn't known 15 minutes ago. And I said to her, Good morning, my name is Stuart Tyner. (laughs) And uh, she introduced herself. And you know, we became family members. And that was uh, 23 years ago, Thursday. And that woman has become uh, a dear friend of ours. She was going through a hard time in her life. She had two little kids the same age as my two older kids. And uh, we got to be good friends. Everybody's different. Everybody starts out different. Everybody learns differently. Even in the same family, we're all different. But I want to tell you tonight... There's only one camp meeting tent. There's only one place for us all to be. It's not uh, youth here and teens there and adults there and kindy there and juniors. When we come to being God's children, there's only one tent, only one place. It's the tent we're in tonight. It's the tent that uh, we're all in when we're God's children. And when we find out more about each other, to find out that in spite of all the differences that we have, in spite of the ethnic differences and the age differences and the gender differences and the cultural differences and all of that, in spite of all of that, underneath we're all exactly the same. There's only one camp meeting tent. Some people try to put differences between us. They say there are different ways that we're saved. Tomorrow night I want to talk about how we're saved, how it happens that we ever get to heaven. How does it happen that we get from here where we are in this beautiful place to where we ultimately want to be? There's only one way that it happens. Some people think there are many ways. There's only one. Some people would like to say that there are differences in the way that we worship. And there are many styles of worship that that divide us. But I want to tell you on uh, 
Tuesday night, there's only one way to worship. We'll talk about that on Tuesday night. Friday night, I'd like to talk about uh, the fact that there's only one Christian standard, even though a lot of people would like you to think that there are certain standards for good people and other standards for bad people. And if you don't have the standards that they have, you must be a bad person. I want to tell you Friday night, there's only one Christian standard. And Sabbath morning this week, I'm going to tell you that there is only one reason to serve anybody else. Not many reasons, just one. On Wednesday night and Thursday night, I'd like to talk about whatever it is that's on your heart this week. Uh, We're going to have some cards for you. uh, I don't know, maybe uh, down here uh, later tonight and in the back. And if you think of a question, just write it on the on the card, and we'll have places to collect them. And I'll I'll be reading those the next couple days. And on Wednesday night and Thursday night, we'll talk about the the only answers to your questions. Um, tonight, though, I want to talk about a few people that would like us to think that we're different from each other because there are some people who are terrible sinners. And there are other people that aren't too bad in this category. Some people divide us by the sins that we commit. I was at another camp meeting, and I, I had uh, evening meetings like this one, talking to uh, young adults like you. And in the morning, in the uh, big tent, I was kind of re- reviewing what I had talked about the night before. So if I talked about acceptance on the evening meeting, the next day I would I would say to people, what would you what questions would you like to ask about acceptance? Or if I if I talked about salvation in the evening, then in the morning I would say, What what would you like to say about salvation? What are the questions that you had? And I would try to answer them. And one night I had talked about accepting everybody, how the Christian church is uh, known for opening its arms wide to people. And a man way in the back stood up, who was an older man, and he said, last night you talked about accepting people, but I want to tell you that you can go too far with acceptance. You can cross the line with acceptance. I said, I'm not sure I'm following you. Would you tell me what you mean? And he stood there and he folded his arms and he put his head back and he said, Well, just suppose one Sabbath morning at your church, you're getting ready to worship, and a man shows up at the outside of your church, and he knocks on the door, and he'd like to come in. And you'd find out that he's a drug dealer or a homosexual. You're going to accept him into the church? Now what are you going to do? Well, it's a good question. And I thought this is what we needed to talk about. I didn't know why he was saying those questions. I didn't know what was behind what he had to say, but he was sure interested in it. And so I said, imagine that I went up to the young, let's say he's a homosexual at the door of the church, and I say to him, uh, I've just been reading Romans chapter 1, and on the basis of the Word of God in chapter 1 of Romans, I think it's time that you turn around and leave. You're not welcome in my church on the basis of what it says here in the Bible. And imagine, I said to the man standing in the back, that the young man has also read the book of Romans, and he says to me, on the basis of your arrogance in Romans 1, you're the one that ought to leave, and I ought to come in. What do I say to him then? I looked at the man, and I said, what do you think? What should I say? He sat down very quickly. Didn't have anything to say. It's pretty quiet in the room. What am I going to say to that young man? In in Romans 1, many of us have seen a hierarchy of sins. These are the bad sins. These sins aren't too bad. I don't think that's what it says. Romans 1 is just a list. And if you understand the way that Paul was communicating to the church in Rome, and you see his argument through the first little bit of the book of Romans, you see clearly what he's trying to do. He, his letter was read to the people in the pews at the Church of Rome in a meeting very much like this. Somebody got up and said, I have a letter from Paul. May I read it to you? This is what we're going to do today in church. 
Everybody was excited to get the letter and Paul does his little greeting and then he says that God's wrath is coming down against all sin. And you can see that Paul thought that what the people in the church at Rome would do would be to look out the windows or the tent flaps at all the other people that are on the outside. There in the middle of Rome, they were looking at people who lived in the most cosmopolitan city in the empire, walking up and down people of all kinds of stripes. And he would say to them, they would, they would be thinking, look what's going on at those wicked people out there. Those are the people Paul's talking about. And you can just see Paul hoping that they'll get that idea about how bad those people are. The list uh, is an amazing list. Read it sometime. It includes uh, greed, envy, strife, being insolent and arrogant, disobeying your parents. Anybody here guilty of any of those? Paul just lumped everybody into one big lump. Look what's happening here. And then he says to all of those people who are looking out at the people passing by, thinking about what terrible sinners they are, Paul then says, you have no excuse, you who pass judgment on all those people standing walking by the church. And suddenly the people in the church at Rome said, whoa, wait a minute, he's talking about me now. What's going on? I thought he wanted us to talk about how bad those people are. Now he's saying that we're just the same. What's going on here? And then Paul begins to talk about how God is going to pay everybody according to what they do. To the good people he'll reward with goodness and to the bad people he'll reward with eternal damnation. And the people in the church in Rome began to relax a little bit and he said, oh, that's what Paul's talking about. We are the people that are doing good and those are the people that are doing bad. Thank you, at least he was talking about that. And then Paul continues to go on and he says at the beginning of chapter 3, he quotes the Old Testament and he said, now all of you are shaking your head thanking me that I'm not talking about those people. Listen to this. There's no one that does good, not one. You see why the tent, there's only one tent? Because there's nobody that does good. We all are not seeking God the way that we should. Now, I know that you know good people. There's some good people in these campgrounds tonight. Many of you are great people and you do good things. Paul's not saying nobody ever does anything good. He's saying you're not good enough to get to heaven by yourself. That's the point. When it comes to getting to heaven, there's only one camp meeting tent. We're all in it, and we're not going anywhere. This is as far as we get. This is it. What am I supposed to say to the young man in the back? Nobody answered. Everybody sat quietly. And all of a sudden, a young man in the front row spoke up. I had noticed this young man before. He'd been in the front row of my meetings in the evening. Every morning when I talked, he was there in the front row. He had beautiful blue piercing eyes. He followed me when I walked back and forth. He was taking notes. I could tell he was interested. And all of a sudden I heard his voice and he said, well, you're speaking to him. And I said, well, I know at least I'm talking to him in the back of the church. I suppose that's a good thing. But the question I want to know is, what am I supposed to say? And the young man said, no. You're speaking to him. And I said, yeah, yeah, but the question is, what am I supposed to say? And he stood up and he said, no, you're speaking to him. And then I understood what he meant. And I walked over to him and I said, uh, this is a big group. Is this something you want to say to the group? And he said, absolutely. I said, what is it that you want to say to us? And he began to tell a story about growing up in an Adventist church, going to a Sabbath school class every week. And one day, the Sabbath school teacher kept him after Sabbath school, introduced him to a different lifestyle than he'd ever known before. He was 10 years old. He didn't go up to church that day. When he went home, he told his brother what had happened. And his brother went immediately to his mother and told his mother what had happened. And his mother picked up the phone and called the pastor of the church. And the church called a special church board meeting that afternoon. But he said to the mother, I want the boy there to tell me what happened. Ten years old, the boy came, and as he stood up to tell what happened, he looked, and there was a Sabbath school teacher standing right there. The boy haltingly got out his story. The pastor and the church board turned to the Sabbath school teacher, 
And the teacher said, it never happened, he's a liar. And the church board said to the 10-year-old boy, we don't want you to come back to this church, you're a troublemaker, you get out. And at 10 years of age, he left his home, stayed for a couple years with some friends, and then began to live a life on the streets of the city where he lived. After many years, feeling that he was about to die, ravaged with sickness, he literally crawled back to his grandmother's house. And he said to his grandmother, I'd like to die here. And she picked him up from the front porch and laid him in her bed and nursed him back to health. He didn't have AIDS like he thought he did. She began to feed him good food and give him good things to drink and give him the right medication. And slowly the young man got his health back. And then grandmother one day was sitting on the side of the bed and she said to him, you know what you need? You need a church family. And you know what the boy thought when he heard that. And he said, Grandma, I'm never going to go to church again. Grandmother said, you know, my church isn't like that. I think you'd like the people there. I think they'd like you. By this point in his story, he was standing in front. I was sitting in his chair. And everybody was leaning forward listening to this young man's story. He said, I began to go to church every Sabbath. People in the church began to accept me. They began to love me. They began to look forward to the Sabbath I was there and tell me they missed me when I wasn't there. And he said, I'm not everything that you want me to be, but I do want you to know I'm getting acquainted with Jesus Christ. Somebody over on this side of the room raised their hand and said, Stuart, may I say a word to this young man? I said, absolutely. And she said, may I ask your forgiveness on behalf of the church that threw you out when you were 10 years old? He said, of course. Somebody over here stood up and said, would, would you mind if, if we came and knelt with you and we prayed together and, and asked God that the forgiveness that we want from you just extends and maybe something important can happen here. And somebody else said, I want to be a part of that circle. I, I want to pray too. And somebody else said, I think maybe a lot of us would like to pray with you. Would it be all right? And suddenly people were standing to their feet all over the room and coming to the front. And this young man just a little over 20 years old, was, was looking at the people coming from everywhere. And, and suddenly he realized there's only one camp meeting tent. We're all in the same tent together. No hierarchy of sins. No, some of us are worse and some of us are better. We're all in this together, folks. And people began forming circles around him. And, and pretty soon everybody in the room was kneeling in a great circle around this young man. I will never forget that morning. I'll never forget the prayers that I heard offered for this young man. It was incredible. It was just incredible. Everybody was crying. The young man, great tears streaming down his cheek. It was just incredible. As people began to realize that wherever we are, whoever we are, wherever we are in our birth order, whatever our culture, our language, our habits, wherever we live, whatever our name is, no matter how old or what gender, we're all in the same tent together. We all need Jesus to get from here to where we want to go. There's no other way. It's the only thing. And it never happens until you and I admit that we're all in this thing together. I'm not pointing the finger at anybody today and saying, you know, you're a worse sinner than I. It's a good thing you're in the tent tonight. It's not the way it is. Jesus said through Paul to the church at Rome, nobody does good enough to get to heaven. But Jesus has given us His righteousness. And heaven is ours because of that. And we come to a verse like Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. My dear friends, we are all one tonight. No differences among us. We stand at the foot of the cross in exactly level ground. Every one of us, the same place. What a wonderful place to be. As we begin these evening meetings in this beautiful place, and this week of camp meeting, and this year with you and me here, let's remember that we're all in the same tent together. We're all one in Jesus because of what He's done for us. 
And everything that we do the rest of the week, every step we take, everything that we talk about is going to come back to this point, being one in Jesus at the foot of the cross. I hope you'll stay here with me all week. When we get to Sabbath and we're talking about reaching out to other people and serving them, you'll find that the reason is because we started here at the cross tonight. When we talk about the standards that we want to have as Christians, you'll find the reason was because Jesus died for us, that's the reason we even care about standards. Whatever we do as Christians, this is the beginning place and this is the road that we walk on. The cross is the place where we want to be. And I hope you'll be with me all week talking about that. Let's ask God to be with us. Gracious Father in heaven, as we begin this week together, we want you to come into this camp meeting tent, into our hearts, into every word that we say, every prayer that we offer, every song that we sing. And teach us that Jesus is the reason that we are and do and, and, uh, and live and worship and serve. It's all about Jesus. We thank you for that incredible experience that we have when we begin walking with you at the foot of the cross. Thank you that so many people here tonight already have that experience. They know what it means to walk closely with you and to be close with you every day of their lives, every moment of every day. And if there's anyone here tonight that hasn't experienced that yet, there's anyone here tonight that was one time walking closely with you and has walked away a little bit, help them to understand that we're all in here together tonight. We're all starting out anew every moment of our lives at the foot of the cross. Keep, uh, keep after all of us. Keep your arms around all of us. May this be a great week because we're walking with Jesus. We pray in His name.